All right, well, that's the Sunday papers. Now we'll go to our program guest. And joining us early in the morning, Perth time, is the Shadow Minister for Justice and Border Security, Michael Keenan. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Barry. Nice to be with you. If you're going to start closing down detention centres, you'll have to stop the boats. How are you going to stop the boats? Well, we'll do it like we've done it in the past, and that will be by returning to the suite of policies that we used then. Um, people ask us how we're going to solve this problem. We'll solve it in the same fashion as we did when we were in government. Um, we faced this problem before, and we used a very effective suite of policies, um, temporary protection visas, turning the boats back around when it was safe to do so, uh, and also a fair dinkum uh, commitment to offshore processing. Um, if we do that, and if we show the resolve to fully implement those policies, then we will send the message to people smugglers that we are now deadly serious about stopping them and we will stop them as we have done in the past. But will that do it though? Um, you're saying that those measures will... You're getting something like up to 100 a day arriving now and your pledge is to take that back to virtually zero. Well, it will do it, uh, and we're confident that we'll do it because it has worked in the past. Australia's faced this problem uh, over the course of uh, many decades, uh, and it's ebbed and flowed based on the policies that are pursued by the government in Canberra. Um, remember, this problem was solved when the government changed, and the only reason that people smuggling was reinvigorated was because the Labor Party pursued policies that encouraged uh, people to come here in this manner. Uh, we need to go back to a time when we had strong policies uh, that were fully backed um, th th through the resolve of the government in Canberra uh, to do whatever was necessary to make sure that people smugglers couldn't operate in this fashion. Uh, and I feel very confident that if we do get a chance to govern, that we will be able to close this evil trade once again. And, and why would you close the detention centre in the Adelaide Hills? Why would that be the first one off the, the first cab off the rank? Well, if you stop the boats, then obviously you don't need the same level of detention capacity. Uh, Inverbrecky is not a large centre. It only houses about 400 people. It was a centre that was never uh, welcomed by the community there. Uh, and uh, we hope that very soon it will be surplus to requirements. Now, you've raised um, uh, the issue um, of, uh, of people that are, that are in detention in Australia at the moment includes um, an, an, a, an alleged, allegedly an Egyptian terrorist and also a, a Sri Lankan who has been accused of, of murdering his girlfriend. Um, the, the, the government and, and the minister today said that, um, that you are broadcasting sensitive national security matters uh, by raising this in the first place. What do you say to that? Uh, well, the national security breach has already occurred. and it, it occurs when you're not in control over who comes to Australia. Um, then people who we don't want here will take advantage of that. Uh, and that's what's happened in this case. Uh, can I just say in the case of the uh, accused Egyptian terrorist, uh, he in particular is of great concern to us because apparently he was housed in Inverbrackey, um, which is a minimum security facility. It's surrounded by what is essentially a pool fence and there's been plenty of instances where uh, detainees there could walk out and if you had a mind to do that it would be very simple to do. Um, now we need to understand and the Australian people need to understand why the government would hold somebody uh, who was subject to an Interpol red notice which is uh, essentially an international arrest warrant um, would be detained in such a minimum security facility. Um, so it's the government that's breached national security here um, firstly by allowing people to come in through their open borders policy um, but secondly by the manner in which they've been detained um, which in the case of all three of these individuals seems totally inappropriate. But maybe that was the case before they, uh, before they did the checks and, and, and found out who they had on, on their hands. But now he's in, uh, he's in higher security and according to the Minister this morning, um, he's not only in detention but uh, there are security guards present as well. But apparently that only occurred after this case was published in the media and it was only published in the media last weekend. I think that begs the question about whether the Minister even had any idea um, that he had people who were this dangerous uh, within such a low level uh, of detention. Um, we really need to understand what's gone on here. Um, this is the most extraordinary circumstance where somebody could arrive in Australia courtesy of people smugglers. Um, they could be the subject of Interpol's highest level of alert, uh, a red notice being reserved for the most serious criminals, uh, it means they've either been accused or possibly even convicted of the most serious crimes, uh, and that the government's response would be to put them into a detention centre um, from which they could easily escape from if they wanted to do so. Um, so it's up to the Minister and the government to explain how this has been allowed to occur, and also to reassure the Australian people that cases like this are not continuing to be held either in low security detention uh, or, in the case of the Sri Lankan who's been accused of murder, actually in community detention. 
Are you saying that you knew about this before the minister did? Uh, I'm saying that, I, well, I only knew about it when I saw it in the media uh, that occurred last Saturday. Uh, of course, when you're in the opposition, you're not privy to these sorts of details. Uh, but if the minister only heard about it through the media, um, then clearly that would be extraordinarily serious. But there's every indication, unfortunately, that that is actually the case. But his point was that you, you shouldn't have uh, released uh, the details that, that, that you're aware of. But you sent a, you, apparently you faxed the letter off to the minister, but you went to the media before the minister had a chance to read that letter. Uh, well, we wrote to the Minister on Monday seeking a briefing on these matters after they've been raised in the media. Uh, we have not raised any facts publicly that haven't, been, uh, that haven't appeared in the papers. Uh, now, it's the Minister who's privy to all of these details. I think these issues are completely red herrings to try uh, and distract from the embarrassment uh, of what is a very significant national security breach. Uh, the serious matters here are how an accused Egyptian terrorist has arrived here, uh, along with an accused uh, Iranian drug smuggler and an accused murderer from Sri Lanka and then been released into low security detention uh, or in the case of the Sri Lankan as I said into community detention. Uh, now it's up to the Minister to reassure the Australian people um, that this isn't going to occur again and to also explain how it has been allowed to occur in the first place. All right, I want to ask you about how uh, your policies will impact on the relationship with Indonesia because the head of Indonesia's Parliamentary Commission for Foreign Affairs um, has, says, uh, has said that it threatens to harm the relationship, um, that the, the approach of the opposition, and Tony Abbott in particular, is disrespectful. And he suggests that Tony Abbott doesn't understand the problem. Well, we will work very closely with the Indonesian authorities to implement our policy prescription. But we don't need to be apologetic about standing up for the interests of Australia. Uh, it's in the interests of Australia to close down people smuggling. Uh, it's also in the interests of Indonesia, I might add. Um, we will work very closely with the Indonesian authorities to implement our suite of policies. Um, we've had a very strong relationship with them when we were in government in the past, and we were able to implement this policy then. And I'm sure that we'll be able to work with the Indonesian authorities to implement it fully again this time. But you can't just dismiss those sorts of concerns. They were carefully articulated they were directly aimed um, at, at Tony Abbott, I mean, that, that would be disrespectful. Well, look, I appreciate in Indonesia, like in Australia, there's probably a lot of different views uh, across the whole political spectrum. Uh, we will seek to have a very close working relationship with the Indonesian government. Uh, Tony Abbott's already been up there with his most senior ministers and met with the Indonesian president. Uh, we are going to implement policies that are in Australia's national interest, uh, but we will work with the Indonesian authorities and I don't doubt that we'll have a very constructive working relationship with them uh, as we have done when we were in government in the Howard years. Now, I'm sure you saw pictures this week of a Sri Lankan man who um, is out here on a 457 visa, went back to, uh, to Sri Lanka just recently to, to help out uh, an uncle at a restaurant, and there's evidence that he was tortured while he was there, all, all of this happening in just the past month. Does that make you reconsider your attitude towards the Sri Lankan regime? Well, uh, unlike a lot of commentators on this issue, I and Scott Morrison and Julie Bishop actually visited Sri Lanka earlier this year. And we did spend a lot of time in the north of the country, which was um, the, 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 uh, the occupied Tamil heartland, if you like. Uh, and we were taken around by the mainstream Tamil political party. Um, we spent a lot of time with the UNHCR and with NGOs operating up there. Uh, and I feel very confident that since the end of the war, um, things have been vastly improving in Sri Lanka. And it's important to us, I think, to continue to engage with the Sri Lankan government to make sure that that is the case. Um, but uh, things have vastly improved since the end of the war uh, on any measure that you care um, to look at. Um, well, and well, you you say important. that, but Amnesty International says violations are increasing again. Uh, well, we spoke to the international NGOs that were represented on the ground in the north of Sri Lanka, and that is not the feedback that we got. What do you make of the, the Canadians' attitude towards Chogham that will be held in Sri Lanka in November? The Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, says he will not be going. What do you think Australia should do? Well, I think it's very important for Australia to continue to engage Sri Lanka. Um, things have improved uh, there vastly since the end of the war, and the Australian government has actually been instrumental in that by being one of the most uh, significant aid donors to Sri Lanka. Um, isolation is not the answer here. Uh, the answer is continue to talk to the Sri Lankans uh, about continuing to improve circumstances on the ground there and actually support the position that the government's taken here. Uh, and we certainly should be present at Chogham uh, when it occurs there later this year. 
OK, as Minister for Justice, are you, are you disturbed that so many footballers in the NRL and the AFL seem to be in Asada's sights um, that they, it, it does seem to point to widespread cheating in both codes? Well, I am concerned and I'm sure that the Australian anti-doping authorities will be able to play a constructive role there. Um, what I a little bit, uh, what I'm not as uh, what I am a little bit concerned about is the way that the government made the announcement. Uh, clearly, we do have a problem in those two codes, but the net was cast very widely by um, Jason Clare and Kate Lundy um, when they fronted the Australian community uh, and essentially. Um, questioned um, the integrity of uh, all codes in Australia and all sportsmen and women in Australia. Um, we do have a problem in those particular codes, um, but the government casts its net so widely and I think it's time that they start to pair that back and say um, that they uh, really over the pudding in that particular case. And do you think this is a matter for the Crime Commission or ASADA alone? Well, I think ASADA should be resourced properly to do this job. Uh, the Crime Commission is the most powerful law enforcement agency in the country, uh, and we believe that they should be chasing the most serious criminals. Um, now, we have uh, specific anti-doping authorities to deal with doping. Um, they should be given the resources to do that job, uh, and we would like to see the Crime Commission focused on the most serious criminals, um, as the most powerful law enforcement agency should. But without the Crime Commission, though, there would be no phone tapping and no proactive investigation. It would be so much harder for Asada to get to the truth. Well, that's right. But I think the fact that the Crime Commission has those extensive powers means that they should be focusing on the most serious criminals that we do have. Uh, and that's what we will direct them to do uh, if we do get a chance to govern after September. Well, you'll take them off this case and get them to do other work? Uh, well, we do have an authority that already exists specifically to deal with anti-doping. Um, they, the th th they need to be given the resources and the powers to do that job properly. Um, it's the Crime Commission um, that we believe should be focusing on the most serious criminals in our community. Uh, and when I think of the most serious criminals, I think of bikies and I think of the crime kingpins um, within the, the most serious organised criminal investigations. But the Crime, uh, commission, Asada should do the crime commission says that organised crime, though, is involved in this, uh, that they're trying to compromise players uh, to fix matches. That, that puts organised crime right at the centre of this, and that's what the Crime Commission does. Well, that's right, Barry, and they have looked extensively at this, and I think it's now time for ASADA to take the running on it. Um, the Crime Commission has essentially, uh, well, it has the broadest powers of any law enforcement agency in Australia, uh, and we believe that they should be looking at the most serious criminal activity in Australia. Uh, and in the case of Australia, that would mean bikey gangs, uh, and that would mean the most serious organised criminals that we have. So we're very keen to make sure that that's where their focus is, uh, and to let the anti-doping authorities get on with investigating anti-doping cases. Michael Keenan, thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Barry.